Welcome, everybody. This has been talked about for some time. This is the great ESG debate. I wanted to call this ESG is the most important topic in mining, or ESG is the least important topic in mining. And I can swing either way on that. So when I have problems, I call people who are much smarter than I am and who know the region much better than I do. <laughs> and for this, we're talking to Mel and Chris. Now, for those of you who don't know, that's Dr. Mel, but for this, we'll leave it at just Mel. And uh, everybody in mining knows Chris Ecclestone. Unless there's money going into the company and showing some kind of return for shareholders, Chris is against the idea. So this is going to be socialism versus capitalism. So let's I'm start. I'm the with, capitalist. And I don't know. I don't know about that, but we're going to find out. Remember, you're supposed to talk, talk socialist, act capitalist. And on that note, off we go. ESG has entered the corporate world, and it's here in the mining industry. It's a buzzword that means many different things to many different people. It has long definitions and short definitions. So today we're going to talk about ESG. Uh, those of you on the call know that I generally like snappy interviews. Today's not going to be that format. This is not an easy topic. So you will get to wax poetic, at least for the first half hour, and then things will snap up in the second half hour. Um, because I'm not Chris Wallace, there will be no interrupting allowed. That's an American politics joke for those of you in Melbourne. So, in 30 words or less, Chris, we'll start with you. What qualifies you to have an opinion on this topic? Well, as an investor in mining, um, rather than as an analyst, one should have uh, an opinion because uh, companies that one invests in, um, if they fully ascribe to uh, ESG uh, worship, um, they may be detracting from your investment return. Mel, over to you, please. What qualifies you to have an opinion on this topic? Well, as a practitioner of it in the industry for 15 years and a semi-practitioner of it in the U.S. government for a further five before that, I think I can say that I've seen some aspects of it, both from the regulatory confusion side and the pragmatic implementation side. So excellent. for so that reason. A little, little longer than 30 words, but still excellent. So then let's start with you. Mel, how do you define ESG? I define ESG as a fundamental set of activities which companies can take across three or more parameter areas the core three being environmental, social, and governance. And by taking these sets of actions in a cohesive, coherent, and well-thought-out way, they can minimize risk and help in attracting investment and permitting, which, of course, is necessary for sustainability. Can you expand upon the S, please? I read it as more than just social. The S is the most complicated because it deals with people and people are always complicated. And until fairly recently, the S would have been more narrowly defined as communities and stakeholders, stakeholders, including investors and interested parties such as NGOs. Um, it has now become much broader. It includes average individuals who may be rioting in the streets or cutting off roads, even though they are not residents of communities nearby mines, even though they are not obviously investors in mines. And because of that broadening, we have also found that a couple of other initials have crept in under the S rubric. Right. And those of course are the politically sensitive ones of diversity, equity, and inclusivity. We're gonna come back to DEI later as a subset of ESG. Chris, over to you. What's your definition of ESG? And keep it polite. Uh, old wine in new bottles. Uh, the E and the S and the G have been around for a long time. Some companies have been um, uh, doing these things. Um, you know, good corporate governance can go back 100 years uh, or 200 years. Um, you know, when there were robber barons around, um, there were also people who ran their companies ethically. Um, uh, as for the social aspect, uh, uh, you, you need to go no further than uh, the chocolate barons in the UK who used to um, 
like um, Cadbury, for instance, who would build whole villages and towns that they would be actually model communities surrounding their factories. Um, and uh, there's no reason why mining companies um, should not be doing that now. And there's uh, mining companies that have done this for a long time. They've created like uh, communities around their mines and they've interacted with local communities, building schools, hospitals, whatever. Um, and uh, environmental, you know, environmental is probably the one that I think is the most important um, because it's the one that, um, that some companies seem to think they do the minimum. Uh, they create a tailings dam and they just hope that it's still going to be standing up in 30 years, 20 years after they've departed into the uh, into the sunset. Right. Um, but these things are things that uh, are either mandated by law in terms of, uh, you know, environmental bonding or whatever. Um, and the other things are things that are just sort of like good corporate practice. Um, so I'm not seeing anything new in ESG except... Um, the aspect that it's been sort of, uh, you know, mythologized and turned into an object of worship um, with a, a priesthood of ESG around it who are a sort of hardcore um, black robed people who, um, you know, uh, uh, they they profess the liturgy of ESG. Um, I've heard, that's Chris, I've heard that's you describe I want to learn. I've heard you describe it before as the cult of the consultancy. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Any opportunity to breed uh, further consulting opportunities is rapidly seized by the by the cons uh, by the nomenclatura of consultancy world. So, what's wrong with ESG? So, so, a couple of guys in the company have to work on it. Got to go out in the community. What's wrong with ESG, Chris? Uh, it's it's more what um, the practitioners do with it than anything being wrong with it. Um, you know, used to get websites of companies used to say community relations, and uh, you know what we're doing with the local community. We're planting trees, we're buying the goats, we're building a water source, so drilling more wells, uh, things like that. Uh, that used to be on the websites. Now it all has to be on a ESG tab on the website. Well, why? Um, why it's not mandated that you have to call ESG ESG, you can call it whatever you want. Um, but suddenly the investors get all sort of worried that you, you're not concerned about ESG unless you're tugging the forelock to the three letters of doom. So, Mel, there's a cost to carrying out an ESG mandate to any company, but here we're talking about mining companies. The cost to a junior explorer could be horrific. What would be the cost to a junior mining company carrying out an ESG mandate? I think that the cost to a junior mining company would be horrific if they were trying to be a Rio Tinto or if they were trying to be a BHP. But in point of fact, junior miners have an outstanding opportunity to prove that small is also excellent, by which I mean Forward planning and integration of ESG should be part of a vibrant growth plan. I would hesitate to think that there are any junior miners or even exploration companies who don't harbor visions of growth, who don't have plans to become larger and perhaps market dominating. So there are some very pragmatic fundamental steps that junior miners can take that don't cost a fortune. One of those is do some stakeholder mapping. Really sit down and think about who has eyes on you and be able to speak to the fundamentals of an ESG plan. You know, I, I sit on the board of some junior mining companies and this is the strategy that we're following. By the way, Christopher, no black robes here. I'm wearing green for my environmental concerns. <laughs> um, so be able to speak to that, be able to show it on your website and be realistic. Nobody expects a junior miner to be a Rio Tinto, but the public, Christopher, is who's driving the change. Better informed citizenry, not just institutional investors. And that's what's driving companies to have ESG tabs on their websites so that the average Joe 
who clicks on company X can see, oh, okay, they have the fundamentals of an ESG plan. They're already talking about, we know who our stakeholders are. We know what their concerns are. We have a vision for addressing those in an appropriate time frame. We are prepared to commit the human capital, which is what we are able to commit at this time to our vision and be able to articulate that to investors. In this case, being institutional investors, when I say investors. So when we, right. when uh, we Mel, junior miners go out to collect money, be able interrupt. to say what we plan. I thought you said no interruptions were allowed. No, no, by Chris, I get to interrupt. <laughs> but you just migrated from average Joe to institutional investor. Those are two different targets. Because both classes matter. And for the average Joe, being able to put something up on your website that is realistic for where you are, but aspirational for where you want to be and speaks clearly to your thought process and plan for getting there, that's for the average Joe investor who's going to go and plump their money down in an ETF. But as a company, when we go out to the institutional investors, whether that's Fidelity or JP Morgan or you know whoever, you, we also need to be able to articulate Macro. that vision and aha interruption and be able to <laughs> do so one. in a convincing articulate manner. Chris, over to you. No, I'm, I'm very much agreeing with Mel. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, why would a junior try and, and imitate what uh, RTZ have to do um, to, uh, to uh, uh, provide ESG coverage for what in the case of most juniors is just a few drill pads. Um, you can't when agree it comes with down to it out in the universe of the hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of junior miners out there, um, most of them aren't doing all that much, um, as we know. And so, most of them don't have aspirations to do all that much, except to sell themselves for a large amount of money at some point. And that doesn't involve uh, in virtually any case, uh, a shovel actually going into the ground and moving a, 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 a blade of grass or a sage grouse or a cacti or whatever. Um, you know, they'll put their jaw pads in, they'll, they'll drive over a few of the, the local species um, in their big four by fours. Um, and then they'll do their drilling. Uh, they'll come up with their 43 101s and then they'll be flogging them around around the blocks of House Street, hoping someone will buy them out. Um, we need to look at the dichotomy between a retail um, that... Uh, okay, that's know, actually that's, that's not my next in, point in I'm getting to. ...ESG as institutional is. The Toronto Stock Exchange, the TMX, is one of the leading sources of raising capital around the world. And it's getting into ESG as a mandate, not as a nice to have, but a have to have. They're promoting diversity on boards. Why is the regulator getting involved in this? Virtue signaling. Let, let me give you a different. Let me give you a different answer to that. They're getting involved in it in part because the industry is crying out for a standard that it can adhere to, because there are plenty of them floating around in various iterations. Whether you want to talk about the copper mark whether you wanna talk about the guidance from the International Council of Mining and Metals, or perhaps you, know, you wanna look at what the National Mining Association in the United States is offering as guidance. Then there's the United Nations. The list is virtually endless and it justifiably creates confusion, not just for juniors, for majors too. And therefore, you know, Securities and Exchange Commission, the European Union, the Toronto Stock Exchange, are looking at providing a regulatory framework that would go to Chris's earlier point about sort of endless reporting rubrics and we've already been doing it, but now we have to do it differently to save companies money and to clarify for those two categories of investors, what they can legitimately be judging companies on in terms of are you an ESG performer or not? The, you know, Chris's answer was short and sweet. Yours was a lot of milk and motherhood. <laughs> no, it's very pragmatic, Peter, because, you know, as I told you, I worked in this area. Yeah, but anything you involved have to know United what Nations to report. Cannot and be you considered have to pragmatic. know when to report it. And right now, we don't have that clarity in the industry. 
Why do we need it? The priesthood of ESG requires acolytes. Um, and you know, the priests have to be kept busy. And the TMX is obviously looking to keep the priests busy, keep the priests occupied. Um, you know, when you talk about diversity, people are talking about ethnic diversity or uh, gender diversity. I'd like to see diversity on Canadian boards. I'd like to see less geologists. More real people and less geologists. I gave a speech a few years ago where I said that no geologist could be a CEO unless he had at least two years experience on a board and I got booed out of the room. There you go. All right. But that would not happen in Australia. <laughs> so we also have ISS and Glass Lewis issuing their recommendations and their voting guidelines saying that their guidelines will look to ESG and diversification when making voting recommendations. So, Jack, this brings out the neocon in me. Doesn't a company's obligation to its shareholders trump its obligations to feeling good about itself? Do you think shareholders are not part of the real people that are invested in the company, Peter? Because coming back to your earlier question, why is guidance even needed? It's because the world has changed and it's not going to change back. Climate change is here. Companies are dealing with it. Governments are dealing with it. Militaries are dealing with it. And ordinary people are dealing with it. Um, particularly during COVID, society's changed and people have become more aggressively assertive about what they rightly or wrongly perceive to be their rights and entitlements. And because those factors are not going to change, and because shareholders are not some amorphous class, they are honest to God, real people with real expectations. Companies need to respond to that in order to thrive. But doesn't the shareholders, of course, can always exit if they don't like what they see. And that's what's happened. When you look at ESG funds around the world and the exponential growth that has happened in those ESG ETFs over the last few years, explosively in the US, a growth of over 300% from 2020 to, to, to today. It says that people are voting with their wallets. They're leaving companies that they perceive, again, they perceive rightly or wrongly because we don't have an objective standard to not be meeting their ESG expectations and they're moving their wallets to companies that they think are, or at least are trying to. It's very interesting you should mention that because of the 10 largest ESG funds by assets uh, have posted double-digit losses this year, so greater than the loss in the S&P 500. BlackRock's $20 billion ESG Aware ETF is down 19%, and Vanguard's $5.8 billion US stock ETF is down 22%. In the same time, ExxonMobil is up 69.8%. I am long ExxonMobil. I am not a participant in those other ones. And I am a happy camper, I've got to say. Yeah, I think we all have Mr. Putin to thank for a temporary blip. But let's no, look I at bought, some, yeah, I bought it let's, from Marvel, let's look at some countervailing realities. The already the writing was on the wall that uh, the chickens would come home to roost to mix some metaphors in the oil and gas space. But we're in the middle of a recession or we're starting one <laughs> three quarters of the way through. And it's easy in a company to cut the fat first. ESG is soft. You're not going to cut your geologist. You're going to cut the soft parts. So, Mel, when you say the world is changing and will never change back, how is the recession affecting that? The same way that recessions always affect every market <coughs> and every, every company behavior. I don't disagree with you that in, in far too many companies, the ESG stuff is regarded as the soft stuff. But let me tell you what. It's the soft stuff that cuts straight to the underbelly when things go wrong. When uh, protesters shut down the road to the port and you can't export your product, you begin to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. When governments decide to pass laws that say that unless you comply with their expectations, you will pay either a much higher tax or you will be le legally not allowed to export your product, you start to lose millions of dollars a day. The soft stuff kills you in the end. And companies that cut it just for the sake of expediency are not only short-sighted, but stupid. Chris? I'm not seeing a dichotomy here between producers and explorers. And uh, there's a big dichotomy between them. 
explorers are drilling. Um, you know, largely uh, they cannot expect uh, local communities, I mean, that uh, a company is coming in doing a couple of drill holes for a week or two <coughs> is going to build a new wing on the uh, the town's uh, local town's hospital, um, whereas they can expect that if um, you know you've got one of the world's largest copper mines being built on their doorstep, um, it's a totally different equation between the two. I mean that that junior miner going a junior explorer going in and drilling a few holes has to ensure, in my version of ESG, that um, one they're not uh, you know displacing or dirtying the local. Uh, inhabitants water, um, that they're providing jobs locally. So, uh, you know, I'm a big critic of fly in, fly out, which I regard as a, 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 a particularly noxious uh, way of not giving jobs to locals. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's different criteria. I mean, if you're a large major building a large mine on the, the verge of some Peruvian town, um, you know, you've got to interact with the locals. You've got to give them something because, you know, one of the common complaints in Peru is that there are royalties raised at both the provincial and the national level and they never come back to the local community. So the mining companies then say, well, we pay. We paid our royalty. And then but you look at the local town and you see not a dime is coming back from the, the potentates in the capital uh, back to the... Um, uh, improving the lives, lives and uh, you know uh, conditions of the locals. So that's um, that's an excellent place to move to a real life example. I read Glencore's 2021 annual report. Anybody else read it? No, Chris, I'm a, share, I'm a shareholder, but I haven't. <laughs> so no. Glencore is a good example because, as we all know, it's carried on business in some interesting jurisdictions. And it's had its wrist slapped a few times. So in, e in Glencore's <laughs> 2021 report, Mel, care to guess how many times it mentioned ESG? Hell, if it's Glencore, one. Chris? Oh, I do. I couldn't even venture a guess. 27. 27? Virtue Hi. signaling. Tied to compensation, RSUs, bonuses. Uh, there's a there's a <laughs> ESG committee. And a committee member sits on other committees. Yeah, and they get paid more for doing it. 27 times. Then I pulled out its third quarter report, unaudited. Care to guess how many times ESG was mentioned in that report? None. None. So what happened between the audit and the annual report for the full year and the third quarter? where it didn't well, care about ESG anymore. Well, clearly the auditors care about ESG, but Glencore doesn't. Reality check, perhaps. Oh, I, uh, oh, and well. I'm actually seeing the comment that's very relevant to that, that <coughs> in, in, in that intervening time, Glencore got publicly slammed with a very large fine for its behavior in the DRC. Yes. Which would, of course, make it look immensely hypocritical to be touting all of its wonderful ESG credentials. But you know, I want to I want to really quickly touch on something that Christopher has now said twice. Is is there somehow, you know, companies that are in exploratory phase don't need to be concerned about these things. It's all a game for giants. Well, in fairness, I, he didn't he didn't yeah, say no, that. He, didn't say he said that. there were different different criteria applied. Exactly. Different levels of ESG for different companies at different levels. Which I agree with, but the implication which is present there is that. The companies that are drilling need to be less concerned about that. And I would say that that's not true for two reasons. If those drilling companies are looking to sell to a major, majors are increasingly scrutinizing the viability of the, of the companies, even at exploratory level and the properties that they're developing. So concrete case in point, I'm aware of a company that's interested in doing a lithium project and is having trouble with indigenous people around that project. And step three is having a lot of trouble being able to market the project. So I just wanted to come back to that, that there is a connectivity there that says that while the scale is obviously different and the monetary commitment likewise, the level of concern needs to be present. And as for Glencore, 
Glencore is, is frequently accused of so-called greenwashing. Yes. And I would say that perhaps 27 examples is a wonderful instance of greenwashing. But what happened? Like 27 comments on it in the annual report and then nada in the third quarter. Were they yes. just tap dancing with the regulators? Yes. Yeah. Versus but then again, you know, quarterly results, you don't have to reiterate, you know, things that you've said before. I mean, it's, they're basically, you know, what did we do in the quarter? Um, in terms financially, pr principally, um, that's the main thing. How, I didn't check. How's Glencore stock done in the past year? Uh, it was down and now it's on the rise. Positively, well, the fine probably had something to do with its negativity. Uh, no fine. Do you think that's really the company's always been right, writing for a fall in terms of fines. Um, so it's, it's a surprise it's taken so long for the fines to actually sort of stick. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, look, this company is, is not just suddenly fallen off the wagon. It's been off the wagon for a long, long time. And now it's trying to get back on the wagon. Um, you know, pay a few fines, whatever. Um, you know, um, if you're looking for the great Satan in the mining, in the, the trading space, um, definitely uh, Glencore is a, a good candidate. <laughs> do you find, Mel, do you find it hypocritical from the annual report to the third quarter? I find it, yes, I find it hypocritical. I find it, you know, expedient and I find it typical yeah. of Glencore. They operate uh, globally in, in exactly this way. And yet it seems nobody cares. Oh, the I wouldn't SD say that nobody cares. I would not say that at all. A lot of, a lot of, <laughs> of countries care that are looking for alternatives to, to a Glencore and a lot of investors care. All right, so let's go to ESG's love child then, being Ooh. EID. Ooh. Equity, inclusion, and diversity. It was explained to, it, it's coming, Chris. It was explained to me that ESG is being invited to the party, but EID is being asked to dance. One is <laughs> external to the company, the other is internal. So Chris, assuming you're not choking over there and you need a Heimlich, what are your thoughts on the matter? Um, you know, the boards of companies should be composed of the best people that, uh, that the company has access to, to put on those boards. Um, I had a situation uh, many years ago when um, I was uh, the CEO of a, a mining company in Turkey and I approached a whole bunch of very high profile um, uh, Turkish women to get them onto the board of the company and they wouldn't would not in any way get onto the board of the company um I was enormously frustrated by this um because uh, you know from what I could see they were the most suitable people the most competent people the most dynamic people um except they didn't have yes in their in their vocab um when it came to stepping up to the plate um, so I was very disappointed by that. Mel, what do you see as the relationship between ESG and EID? Am I right that one is a subset of the other, or are they two separate issues? <coughs> well, one is a subset of the G, not, not necessarily the other two. It's not a subset of the e, the e. Are you having a gender confusion issue, Chris? <laughs> No. I think he just said Mel. No. Environmental, <laughs> social, and governance. These things are part of the G. They're not part of the, the, the E and the S. I actually think that they're part of both the S and the G because, Peter, you're, you're right in the sense that it's both internal and external <laughs> to the company. Because let's take a look at the industry as a whole. Historically and actually, the mining industry has a terrifically hard time attracting women in the first place to work inside of, of the companies. And the ones that they have attracted, they frequently have trouble retaining. What this means is when you start to look at the pipeline for senior managers and or board candidates, it's a pretty tiny pipeline. 
And there certainly are calls to have quotas imposed. Let me say right off the bat, I'm adamantly opposed to quotas in any way, shape, or form. They have no basis in reality. They impose an unreasonable burden on companies in any industry, but particularly the mining industry. But what it does say to me is that as an industry, and that goes across the scope of juniors all the way to the biggest majors, um, collectively, we need to do a, a better job of attracting women. We need to combat this image of, you know, the old style miner with his pick and shovel heading out to the mine and no women are allowed kind of thing. But companies also need to be careful because the women that they have historically attracted tend to be in, in those soft side areas. And those soft side areas historically have not led to the top, which is one reason why companies have had a lot of trouble retaining women. Even worse when the story comes to minorities. Um, the statistics that, that I was able to find, for instance, on indigenous inclusion in, in companies are so small as to be insignificant, not worth mentioning. Um, other minorities, such as, as Blacks or Orientals, the statistics are a bit better, particularly when it's recruitment of men. And me personally, I say, great, let's recruit more diverse men as well. Because diversity isn't just about gender, it's about points of view. <laughs> and it's about being able to speak with credibility to that broader environment of stakeholders. Okay. So then let's move along to the third rail of this conversation. I hope everybody's wearing rubber shoes and you're grounded because we're going to dive into climate change. The TMX has mandated that the TMX companies must talk about climate change and what it's doing to reduce its carbon footprint. And to get the conversation properly footed, when they talk about climate change, they mean anthropomorphic climate change. You know, where I'm sitting 30,000 years ago was under 100 feet of ice. That will happen again. Right now, we're talking about human influenced climate change. Should anthropomorphic climate change actually be part of ESG, like the stock exchange is trying to make it? Are they trying to make a part of the ESG? Or are they just uh, requiring that you put it in your risk factors in your, um, in your annual report? That's a different matter from being ESG. You're right. It's the CSA, not the TMX. The TMX has guidelines, but the CSA is mandating it be part and disclosed as a risk. You also have to disclose yeah. what you're doing to reduce your carbon footprint. I, 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 uh, what's the carbon footprint of a mining executive flying down to the BMO conference in Florida so that you can knock a golf ball around rather than suffer the, you know, the, 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 the snow of, of Toronto in February? Um, yeah, I can't see that going into a disclosure yeah, and, document. You have a special clause in there. Uh, our CEO actually sinned uh, by going to this event and uh, in a private jet, moreover. Oh. No. I'm all for Zooms myself, but um, what I would say to that is, I think that it comes back to a comment that I made earlier about industry tends to like clarity around regulation rather than <coughs> having someone, whether it's a government or an NGO or an indigenous group come to them and say, you're, you're, you're contributing to climate change, you're not doing anything. So having a rubric can be helpful. It's part of the broader rubric around climate change. In many countries, we're already seeing the water crisis. Uh, my principal residence is in Arizona in the United States. And we're but, as it, but as it impacts mining, Mel, like not the this broader is, context, as it this, impacts mining. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Mines are being forced to look at ways to reduce water usage. Because concrete example, here in Arizona, the Colorado River is in a tier one crisis. What that means is a 10% across the board cut to industry, including agriculture, but also mining. Mines are being forced to look at ways to use water more frugally while maintaining production. They are being forced, again, here in Arizona, mining friendly jurisdiction to provide statistics on the pollution from the smelters and what scrubbers are being put in place to reduce that and also the cost of doing so. So climate change, as I said early on in this discussion, 
is, is a reality that it's not going to go away. And the nice thing for the mining industry is, as, as Chris said earlier, it's a very pragmatic group. And, you know, when you're sitting in the Alta Plana in Chile and you know that there's a water crisis, you build a desalinization plant. You don't whine about it. You just do it. And the whining so often comes from politicians. It's ironic. The company is just doing what it needs to do to survive. There seems to be some contradiction in what you're saying, though. On the one hand, you're talking about regulation and reporting and industry and standards, but you're also saying the people want it. Well, if the people want it, let the market dictate who's going to comply how. But keep in mind, Peter, that I very clearly said that regulations, in particularly in this context, are friendly to business because it tells business what is, at the very least, the de minimis expectation of activity on their part. That can be a protection against much broader societal expectations that, of course, ultimately end up with not in my backyard, there'll never be another new mine built. So the regulations can serve to bridge that extreme gap and give companies a safe zone in which to operate. They can also choke the life out of a company. I would say that that's probably not the case. I haven't seen a lot of companies falling by the wayside only and specifically due to complying with climate regulation. Chris? Can you name one? No, I'd, I'd agree with Mal. I mean, you know, really, if you've got a, a, a mine that is, is going to have a large water requirement, and you don't have much water around, you've got to be pretty creative in coming up with some water. You can't steal it from the local community. So what you really need to do is you need to build uh, dams, catch snow melt or something in the time of the year when that happens, um, or, or work out solutions because otherwise you're not going to have any water. No water, no mine. Um, it's not going to work. Um, uh, I, I think a lot. I, I, I once uh, knew of a tungsten mine in, uh, in uh, Peru. It was listed on the, uh, the TSX and. Um, it quite curiously had a gigantic dam that it had built um, with, uh, with hydro uh, power and everything um, to power this tungsten mine. The tungsten mine was totally told it went bust, uh, but the dam was still there um, with the hydro component, which is now sold to the locals, I presume. Um, but uh, you know, miners need to think of more things than just moving mountains of dirt from here to there. Um, you know, I'm a big critic of uh, high strip ratios. Uh, I, I, I've met companies that say 40 to one strip ratios. And I say, what? Um, and I think we, we're now at the cusp of a moment in which there's going to be a big pushback against um, open pits that uh, move too much earth because the earth is never ultimately taken back and put in the hole. Um, and that needs to be um, ultimately, you know, the remediation of uh, That's because there's no line. value in it to a shareholder. Uh, we moved the stuff, well, we got the materials. Part. Where's bad the value part. to a shareholder in moving the stuff back? Well, that's part of the, maybe the environmental bond needs to be so big that uh, it pays for moving it back. So, um, you know, I mean, coming, coming to, to, uh, to your question, <laughs> there's increasing scrutiny on company mine closure plans as well, and the remediation aspects of those mine closure plans. And of course, some of that is, is a lot of that right now is government driven, because as Chris rightly said earlier, I think that most investors haven't yet reached a stage of sophistication where they consider that an element of their ESG concern. But I think it's a legitimate concern because, you know, drive around in, in the Western United States, you can tell exactly where the old pit mines were. Well, it wasn't so much the pit mine as they were burning the, the, the logs and they flew off into the air and killed all the vegetation. But there's a cost to complying with ESG, whether you're Bob's Mining Company or Rio Tinto. Why and guess what, Peter? It's built into the price of the commodity. Because I can tell you for a fact that when, when, when <laughs> companies sit down of any size, when producing companies sit down to decide what they're going to price their commodity at, they have factored in their so-called soft side costs as well. And so it's, it's, the market is absorbing 
a lot of those costs, which is why companies aren't dropping by the wayside because of conforming to regulation. Producers, sure. But what about the juniors, the shoot the moon types? They can't, they have no commodity to build into because they don't know what they have in the ground yet. Yeah, so you're not, not talking they're about juniors, you're anything, talking about explorers. Most of those guys are just fakers. They're just drilling to, uh, you know, find a, a, a greater fool who will take them out. Yeah, you're not talking about juniors. You're, you're using that phrase very loosely, Peter. You're talking about exploration companies only. Yeah. Yeah. For this part, I am, Mel. Yeah, and, and that's a very narrow spectrum of an already narrow segment of an industry. But <laughs> what I would say is, recall no, what I said earlier. Segment. That's like 1,400 to 1,600 companies on the TSXV. Yeah, um, that's what I'm saying, small. But keep in mind what I said earlier, too, is that those companies largely are trying to sell themselves to larger companies. And those larger companies are placing <laughs> in, increasing expectations <laughs> on what they want from particularly the E in ESG from an exploration company in order to consider purchasing it. But so, harken uh, back to the example I gave you earlier, it touched on the S as well. So we have Bob's mining company that has made a miraculous find, let's say in Newfoundland, a Rio Tinto shows up. Part of due diligence will absolutely be the environmental. Does Rio Tinto in this example really care about the social and the governance? Well, they darn they? sure better because they better look at neighboring Greenland and say to themselves, do I want that to happen? Or yeah. ironically that you picked Rio Tinto in Serbia, they've they just a few days ago, the prime minister of Serbia came out and said that she right now sees absolutely no chance whatsoever for Rio to get its lithium license renewed in that country. So yeah, they better care. Is that because she wasn't bribed enough? <laughs> no, it's because the license was yanked when people took to the streets rioting over it and you know the the government offices were physically attacked for having issued the license so the license was revoked and now she's calling for a large national dialogue because she states rightly that lithium is a vital commodity for serbia's economic growth but she an issue though she added the caveat that we must have a national dialogue on how we wish to move forward. So she's trying to set the stage, but at the moment well, she says there's no way. Ooh, there's Could a happen dirty, in Serbia. If there's all, a dirty they've word. got a long Russian heritage. Yeah, the Mexicans nationalized the most joggy lithium mine that there was. Um, and now the Mexicans are the lucky owners of, of uh, Sonora. Um, good luck to them. Um, yeah, AMLO is a maniac. But but, but, but you more know, the Serbians are doing the same thing. I mean, if there was, I've never heard that there was an environmental problem with the Jada mine. Uh, but what's happened is that Rio Tinto have said, we're out of here, and they've gone to Argentina. They've spent $800 million buying Rincon, and uh, they're happy as pigs in mud. Um, Serbia's lost because Serbia ultimately will have to develop the mine itself or, perish the thought, sell out to the Chinese who will then come in and develop the Jada mine, and if the locals don't like it, you know, a couple of stray bullets might unstrap them out from a so, PLA representative guarding the mine. How can we do the E in environmental if China's not going to play along? Here we are in our own little world. Uh, no, we can what? do that. We can do that. The Chinese are now running into a problem because, you know, while in their own sand pit, they can be as destructive as they like. Once they, once they go outside and they want to buy a project in Canada, Australia, they just can't play by Chinese rules. They have to play by the environmental rules in the other country, unless they're in some sort of country where they can bribe people. But you know, essentially large sections of Latin America, for instance, are shut off to China because the locals don't like them. Um, the locals don't like them anymore. Um, so Africa, you can still bribe someone and get away. But even in Africa, the Chinese are having to play play ball now. Um, it's just it's just not on. Just to, to your question, Peter, as, as I understand it, um, I think that, and I'm going to say as rather than if, because I'm an optimist, as we get more rare earth, lithium, graphite, nickel, <coughs> et cetera, mines permitted around the world outside of China, I think that we'll, the Chinese are going to be forced to change their thinking 
because we're already seeing this tendency where for the offtake agreements, the largest companies are looking for the environmentally sensitive producers to, to be in their supply chain because they as end users, the Apples and the Teslas and so forth are subject to such intense scrutiny in terms of where they're sourcing and how they're sourcing and with whom they're sourcing that they're desperate to see more of these mines permitted and operating. And that effectively will either drive China to change or, wow, here's a thought, drive China out of its market dominance. That's the one I'm, I'm rooting for. Go, guys, go. But with respect to Apple and Tesla, aren't they only doing it to protect their share price? Why does the motivation matter, Peter? <laughs> Everyone doesn't have to be an idealist. Money because matters, money talks, money will always talk. I'm perfectly fine if someone is motivated to do good by money, because one of the things I firmly believe is a company can do well and do good. And that perfectly epitomizes that why not make money for doing the right things? Then you're not making as much money as you could and you're hurting your shareholders. How do you know that? That's a hypothetical statement because remember, you're pricing those costs into your commodity price. Now, almost so, everything, and, and almost we're, everything of S and G is hypothetical. Environmental we can track, but a lot of S and G governance we can track too. All all yeah. those companies like the Glencores have found out that G can be tracked pretty darn well. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm imagining in this crowd somebody has a question or a comment to share. We have ten minutes left. I'm seeing 25 things in the chat. A lot of them have looked interesting as they flowed through. Hey, Tracy, what's happening in the chat? Okay, so we have all kinds of questions here. Let's throw Jeff uh, Swingler, Swingler under the bus first. Jeff? Brent Willis, do you wanna unmute yourself? Do you guys wanna come, you know, thank you everybody. <laughs> Hugh Sharman was uh, talking here. Uh, Finland's, okay, guys, who wants to talk? Jack? Hi, it's uh, Brent Willis here. How are you, Tracy? Hey, uh, so my name is Brent Willis. I uh, run a pharmaceutical company. Uh, we we are a mining company that transformed into a pharmaceutical company. And the long story short is the technology is now out there where you can capture your uh, CO2 off of uh, exhaust streams coming off of a diesel generator or whatnot. And we're moving forward with our company. We're going to be 100% carbon neutral. And uh, let me hang on a second here. I'm going to put my video on. So we're moving forward with a carbon neutral strategy that uh, allows us to extract, take the CO2 out of exhaust stream. It creates a unique carbon allotrope called fullerene, which we are actually going to use to develop new drugs with. and. Uh, that carbon is being sold into the market. It is uh, it creates <coughs> carbon credits which uh, we can sell into the market because we are we are directly extracting CO two and preventing it from going in the atmosphere. And uh, so the industry is changing, the technology is changing. And uh, so from uh, from the environmental side, we're looking at not using any water at our quarry site. We're uh, using dry separation technology. We have very small footprints. It's very environmentally sound. And uh, from the social side, we've always been engaged with First Nations. For uh, I've been involved in mining for 30 years, and that's a big part of it. Sorry to interrupt. But Go ahead. It, it sounds like ESG is your business model, and you're in favor of it because it's making you money. It, it is it, it became a part of our business model because absolutely it is making us money and it's allowing us to be to conform to the ESG guidelines and uh, to become uh, to reduce our carbon footprint to zero. And uh, it's it's because of the technology. So and the technology is uh, is is just it's just starting to be deployed. It's uh, it's been tested. It works. I've seen it running and it's very interesting stuff. But uh, that it's going to change the landscape over the next, uh, you know, I'll start, the company's called Raincage. I'll start deploying this technology here in the in the in Q three, probably Q two to Q three, okay. and uh, it's uh, it's very interesting stuff that's going on up there in the uh, in the carbon capture industry. Yes, Hugh Sharman says, Brent, what minerals are you extracting? I have huge difficulty in believing you. 
<laughs> it's barium sulfate. Uh, we have uh, it's the project called the Francis Creek Project. It's one of the highest grade barium sulfate deposits in the world. And because of that, we use it in pharmaceuticals. And that's how we transitioned into a pharmaceutical uh, uh, company is because we're selling it as ra for radiology drugs, uh, barium contrast for radiology, for uh, CT scans and x-rays. Okay. And uh, what? Barium meal. Oh, what? Great. There I'm off. But... We're today talking about whether or not ESG has any merit in the mining industry. That's your business plan. So you're embracing it as a way to make money. You're in favor. Yes, and, uh, <laughs> but with the technology, um, any exploration company can uh, become carbon neutral by uh, running their drilling programs utilizing carbon capture. Okay, we'll come back to you. Trace, what else do we have? We always have Jack. Jack? Hi, Jack. We always have Jack. Okay. Jack is uh, I, I am I, I am speechless here. Uh, I'm I think I'm older than all of you. And I'm wondering, did any of you study science or the scientific method or thermodynamics or economics? Because uh, to economics. me economics. This, economics. this is this is uh, quite frankly nonsense. Because this is not about the real world. It's about the world as you'd like it to be. It's like you, you think the United Nations Law of the Sea Treaty somehow governs the oceans. You know, it, 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 it's amazing to me. I have nothing <laughs> to, to ask you. I'm just amazed at how much all of you think that this little bit of organic slime on this gigantic ball of magma and metal somehow dictates how the ball operates. And, and I'm just saying, in my lifetime, I've never seen such arrogance by people thinking they can control the environment and that the climate doesn't change every five minutes and always has. Thank you. Jack, can I respond to that for a second? Yeah. yeah. So, so Jack, just, uh, you know, and, I, and I, I agree with your sentiment in a lot of ways, but... Uh, what changed my mind was uh, looking at a rain cage unit that is going to be designed to kick out uh, 30,000 tons a year of carbon that would otherwise go into the atmosphere. And whether you believe it has an effect on climate or not, I don't think it matters anymore. It's more about uh, the fact that uh, um, you're preventing something that was originally not in the atmosphere and you're preventing that from going in. How that affects the climate maybe it has no effect maybe it has effect we don't know but uh, the simple fact is is once once our company gets into production we're going to be putting out you know three football fields a year of super sacks of carbon it's equivalent to a graphite mine so it's significant and that's just off a two megawatt generator so we have to really understand that uh, when you can physically see <laughs> black carbon coming out of an exhaust stream that would otherwise be in a gaseous state going into the atmosphere, there's there's an impact there. There must be. I don't know. I'm not an expert on it. But, aren't you just uh, drops in the ocean? Brett, aren't you just Pardon drops me? in the ocean? CO2? Yeah, what you're doing. You, you feel pretty oh, good. Oh, it's a drop in the ocean. Absolutely a drop in the ocean. But it's the beginning of a drop that will grow into a bucket and hopefully a bathtub and then a swimming pool and then hopefully a lake and then keep going. Yay, right? Brent, it's this technology, absolutely. this technology yes. is going to keep expanding and it, 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 there's going to be a, a whole new carbon market developed out of this. There's going to be carbon trading. There's probably going to be a carbon currency that gets born out of this. There's going to be all sorts it's of things. Carbon currency. And, and, and the, te and the <laughs> technology with fullerene from batteries to uh, um, strengths of materials. It, it's uh, one, of, one of the, you know, people talk about the fourth industrial revolution. Fullerene is what's going to create the fourth industrial re revolution, not uh, academics. It's entrepreneurs and uh, a new commodity that costs right now $2 million a ton, and it's going to come out as a waste product. So it's going to be transformational on a technology side in, in globally. Out of respect for the English language, I did not bring up the carbon credit market or the carbon credit trading platforms, because this is still a family-friendly environment. And I don't know if I could get through that conversation and keep no, it family friendly. 
Yeah, it's bizarro. I don't understand carbon credit trading yet. I've tried. Anybody what else? Next question. We had Ian London a second ago, and he's all over the headlines with the Critical Minerals Alliance and the government. So, uh, yeah. Ian, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I don't want to know that. <laughs> Some of these conversations, I'm, I'm sitting here aghast, only in terms of if you don't believe in climate, Jack, that's fine. You don't believe in it. I'm looking at tomorrow. I'm looking at grandchildren. I'm committed to the thing. And it can only, and it is good for business, even for the exploration companies, because you got to think about tomorrow and where you're evolving to. It does change behaviors by monitoring any numbers you collect. You're an engineer. You start collecting data. You see trends and changes. Uh, Mel, you carry the debate brilliantly. Thank you. And then just one other note, the, Ch the Chinese, there are the International Standards Organization on Critical Materials. The Chinese are at the table. We've actually negotiated standards on traceability, trans uh, policies on provenance. You're right, this is not an easy world. But down the road, the battery, new battery guys, the new magnet folks on recycling, <laughs> et cetera, are making those a requirement. Those are market realities. If you want to make a money, if you want to make a dollar, set me customer needs. Those customers, the Apples, the Teslas, et cetera, why have, a, why have electric vehicles? We could have just run cars. Look what's come out of a space program, new technologies, which are now keeping us healthy. So I look towards tomorrow. Uh, Toronto's cleaner when we got rid of the coal plants. I don't see yellow hues over the city. So, and I'm not an environmentalist. I'm not one of these tree huggers, you know, we just do it. At the end of the day, you block a road, you don't get anywhere. You don't have water, you don't have a mine. So what is this junior pitching? I have the largest resource. That's dirt in the ground, my friend. If we don't transit, we don't get products in line and the new technologies, et cetera, the future doesn't look bright. Mel again, thumbs up. No disrespect, Chris, but I know you were given the, the wrong side of the debate. Oh, <laughs> wow. So it is now where I'm sitting, it's noon. Ian, right now I, no, Ian. Ecclestone's the one that told me ESG was bullshit. He's the one that got me to go get Mel. <laughs> yeah. No, ESG is not bullshit. Um, actually, we've always believed in it. All we're now doing is mechanizing, in some cases, mechanizing it and trying to get some balance and to avoid things like greenwashing. I have the biggest resource. I'm the cleanest. Right. You, <laughs> you, 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 you've cleaned out uh, the last tribe who had uh, you know rights over the lands. Don't just report the good, report the bad. And you want to know Once you report some of the difficult challenges, you actually solve them. And I have a lot of confidence in the junior marketing, junior markets, that they do and have evolved in that direction. Companies like Avalon, one of your, your members on Investor Intel, started 10 years ago. Their business models uh, have changed and their practice and how they're designing their facilities have changed. And we'll make a dollar <laughs> like our, uh, our friend from... I think it's Voyageur because I'm missing a letter behind your head. <laughs> Voyageur. <laughs> All right, guys, we have to wrap up. Yeah, thank so, you. In the blue corner from London, England, Chris Ecclestone. And in the green corner from Arizona, Dr. <laughs> Mel. I appreciate your input. I appreciate your candor. We normally take a vote on who won, but I'm a little biased on this. I'm calling it a tie. <laughs> Anybody who wants to carry on the conversation in person, uh, please contact Chris or Tracy or Dr. Mel or myself. Um, this is an ongoing, evolving topic. Over to you, Trace. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, if you have any further questions, just send it to me. And uh, <laughs> this is the first. We're going to do these monthly. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Bye. all. Bye. Bye.